once upon a time in the magical land of Equestria. Fallout Equestria Heroes by No One. Chapter 5 Beneath the Surface. The most massive characters are seared with scars. We sell guns and gun accessories. Robots were not the best for conversations, less so those that hid behind bulletproof glass. They were also terrible barterers. All their weapons had a set price that I was unable to talk down, even with all of my and Serenity's charm. The robot on the other side was little more than a screen hanging off the ceiling of its booth with various long, spindly arms that waved around uncomfortably. I could just imagine that one of those things could crush the skull of a would-be thief as easily as a pony could crush eggshells, so robbery was out of the question. Reluctantly, I placed my caps on the counter and watched as the robot slid them to his side of the glass and slid my overpriced 308 rounds to me. While it's still fairly wealthy, if you ask me, it just hurt parting with so much money for so little ammo. Though, after how well grenades served me in the past, I made sure to pick up a bushel with no care to the cost. Thank you for your patronage. Patro what? Can I have a gun? Serenity was resting her forelegs on the counter so she could see into the shop. Peering down a little filly, I gave her five seconds to realize how stupid a statement that was before answering. No, I said. Why not? Really? Have I mentioned I hate children? Because, I said, trying out my Karen matron voice, though judging by the look on her face, it didn't work. You haven't been trained. The smallest mistake can kill. Not to mention giving a mentally scarred filly a gun was just a stupid idea. Yeah, I'm an idiot, but I knew guns and when ponies shouldn't be carrying them. Come on, you need a second gunner. Backup. I'm the best backup ever. The little pink filly literally bounced as she bragged. I'm sure, I said. How could I not roll my eyes at that? Maybe if we find a gun range and I can see her skills, she beamed like the sun. However, I still had no intention whatsoever of giving her anything even close to a gun. Ha <laughs> ha, watch out wasteland, Serenity is coming. Catchphrases, i give that a 3 out of 5, plus some bonus points for actually saying it out loud. Now for any other pony, I would kindly point out that in a few hours we'd be, presumably, safe behind the massive walls dais and wouldn't have much need for guns. But I had to let Serenity have her delusions. Sometimes in the wasteland, that's all you really had. Well, that went depressing in a hurry. I backed up from the booth with my wallet emptier, but my guns fuller. All in all, it wasn't such a bad trade. Looking up past the small armory, I could see the massive gray wall dais looking not nearly as impressive as from a distance. What I thought was a massive slab of concrete was, in fact, a loosely held together jumble of wood, stone, brick, and metal that looked ready to fall apart at any second. Atop its ramparts, if I squinted, I could barely make out the signs of ponies patrolling, and for a split second I thought I saw the glint of a scope pointed at me. Stepping back, I surveyed our options. Getting in Dais was not going to be easy, because while from a distance the main entrance looked like a straight walk, the huge gray ruins of old Dais stood in the way, most of which was actually inhabited. Just to get into the ruins, before even the city proper, you had to pass an NCA checkpoint, and somehow I figured that wouldn't be the only obstacle into the city. As I looked at the buildings that towered over the massive makeshift wall, I couldn't blame them for wanting to keep the city safe. Every single pony for miles around could see the city, and I was pretty sure every one of them wanted a piece of it. Me included, if I must be honest. Do you think they'll let us in? Serenity chirped in, breaking my trance. Uh, I shook my head and started towards the NCA guard post literally meters away. Like seemingly of all its kind, the guard post was surrounded by a chain-link fence lined with barbed wire. The rest of the inhabited ruins made do with small walls consisting of train cars, sheets of metal, and mostly jarring, huge metal spikes. Predictably, I chose to take my chances with NCA questioning. Very brave of me, I know. The guard stopped me. State your business in Parasite Mound. Parasite what now? Of all the names I'd ever heard for towns, this was by far the worst. The NCA trooper in his fancy blue uniform and faceless mask managed to glower nonetheless. An impressive feat. Matched only by my not giving a fuck what some schmuck in blue thought. Sex, drugs, rock and rolls, I said. It was a title of a book Wildfire loved in Marefort, and it was more than enough to send Serenity into a giggling fit. Mission accomplished. 
The NCA troop just continued to glower for a second before turning his head towards a small guard post at his back. That's hard, he called out. It was at that point I became acutely aware of the fact several troopers had positioned themselves around the checkpoint, and all of them had their weapons pointed at me. My shoulder couldn't have burned more if Celestia herself put the sun into it. Gulping, I turned to the guard station as the door opened with a smash. Pushing Serena behind me with my back leg, I lowered my body and readied my weapon. Took you long enough, a gravelly voice barked from beyond the door, and I instantly let go of the breath I didn't realize I'd been holding. The burn subsided as a certain ghoul strolled out of the office building as easy as you please. Kick me out of my town, and then you follow me. You're not going to kick the NCA out of here, if that's what you're planning. Not unless someone pays me, I retorted. Hair bold, I'll give you that. You have any idea what you're doing? Not a clue. The rough idea was for me to barge into the watchers, deposit surrender into their care, find out why Dr. Mormon wanted me to go with him. After that, my plans consisted mostly of whiskey and trying to find work. You want into my town? I took a good hard look at the gray unicorn with his molted skin and dead eyes. Then I turned my head to the side of the checkpoint at a place called Parasite Mound. It certainly fit its namesake with gray buildings half torn down by war and half by age, piling atop each other like great concrete hail. Skinny ponies darted back and forth between half-destroyed streets and newly formed alleys, scavenging and sometimes fighting for salvage. It was a stupid name, but I could not think of a single place more apt to it. And from what I heard, it was also the easiest way into the city. Yes, I answered. You can't walk into a place like this like you walked into timber. Ponies here have rules, and they have rulers. And if you don't know both, you'll be dead or dying. Worse yet, you're done. She's not my daughter, I broke in. Serenity pouted behind me. Whatever. Fact is, she'll be dead too unless you know the rules. He smirked and stepped back, waving a hoof at his office. I'll tell you who rules and by what rules for. For a price, I finished. Yeah, I'm pretty stupid. Always have been. But eventually you figure out how the wasteland works. These disturbing reports have been verified by numerous refugees from the north. If you're just joining us now... Lucky snapped on the radio in his office as I took my seat on a pillow across from his desk. The reports have been verified that a huge explosion, reminiscent of a bale fire bomb, has gone off in the heart of Equestria. What more, the elusive enclave has been seen outside of their clouds for the first time ever. What this means for Dice and our very own enclave remnants here in Dice remains to be seen. We'll be reporting back with more news as it becomes available. Distressing. Lucky said, shaking his head at the radio. Huddle mice has been coming through the northern pass in numbers unseen, trying to escape from whatever terror the equestrian wasteland has to offer, and has always offered a lot. Back before the war, equestrian was always larger, did you know? Caledonia was what this land was called, and for reasons no pony could remember. It managed to pay lip service to Celestia without becoming a state of her nation, despite being several degrees smaller in population due to what was once a sizable desert. Now, what was once Caledonia is the new Caledonia Lodge, and we have outgrown our former masters. Now they seek our guidance and power as we once sought theirs, and I have half a mind not to give it to them. His body writhed as he spoke, muscles tense and visibly where his skin had flaked away in his neck. You talk like you were there, I said. Right, a ghoul. Of course he was. I was. Things were starting to make sense. I saw the apocalypse, and they saw me. When I closed my eyes, I see the green flames licking at the sky. And I felt myself slowly wither and die as the come to your ancestors built, stable tech. He managed to make the name sound a curse. Poison me and my family out of fucking curiosity. And I, dead, chose to flip off death and continue to live. Rebuild. I helped turn our glow from a graveyard to a city. I helped form the alliance of the five cities. So, why are you telling me this? I asked. Because I want you to listen to the radio and understand what's at stake. We built up the world from the brink of death, and now Equestria is coming here to kill it again. They'll want food, they'll want blankets, they'll want water and supplies, and they'll want it all for free or they'll turn raider. He leaned in, glaring at me. They always do, Equestrians. Like you. I'm paying for your information, not history, I snapped. Couldn't ponies even rant at the proper times anymore. But I like history, Serenity complained. 
Fine, Lucky said, ignoring the plea of the filly. What do you want to know? How do I get into the city? I asked. Three ways. He smirked at me in an entirely uncomfortable manner. One, you have a passport, either being issued one by the NCA or DAIS indicating you a resident of either or forging a fake one. Two, you prove you're not a tourist with more than 5,000 caps. Three, you provide proof that you have a job waiting for you on the inside. As far as I could see, all these options were out of my reach. Oh, very helpful. What would I expect inside Parasite Mound, I asked. Violence, he said a bit too calmly. It's not NCA territory, though we've agreed to help guard it. A lot of ponies desperate to get into the city live there, some more than others. Do you have anything useful to say? I said. Keep your leg on, he chuckled a bit. <laughs> from what I've seen of your habits, you'll fight a hellhound for the right price. And here that's going to get you and your filly hurt. He stopped tapping at his desk. That goes for here as well as dice. This is not the wasteland where the biggest pony is top dog. Here, if you overstep or take the wrong job, you'll end up in an alley. So I paid you for a warning, I asked. I already regretted going to this idiot pony for help. 200 years old and was unable to give me a solid piece of advice. With a raspy sigh, he magically levitated a piece of paper across the desk to me. Ignoring the pain in my shoulder, I leaned over the mahogany desk. On it was a name and an address. We've well, been investigating a gun shop owner named Deadhead for suspicion of creating fake NCA passports. As it stands, we we're several days before being able to convince the finishers to allow us to arrest him. He shrugged his shoulder. From the way I hear it, his fakes are good, but expensive. I never did find out if his information was worth the caps I spent, as Deadhead wasn't at his shop when I had gone calling, or even why Lucky needed the caps bad enough to charge for such information. Maybe it was supposed to be one of those life lessons I have heard so much about. Everything comes the price, yada yada, something about the soul. You know, the usual tribe mothers and old mares push down the throats of fillers and coals to try to get them to go to bed. Some ponies really took to that sort of thing. Parasite Mound. Can we just stop for one more second for me to say how much I hate that name? Was mostly what I expected from the name. A teeming cesspit of violence and debauchery, cleverly disguised as a cesspit of violence and debauchery. You'll notice it's not actually as crowded as it appears. Certain streets were filled with half-flanked stands of questionable meat and supplies, while other streets managed to be completely empty, save for a hobo or a drug addict sleeping by a derelict building. Rightfully so, I kept Serenity close at all times and forbade her from wandering. If it were not for the locals, the town actually would have been amazing, at least to me. Tall stone buildings, some even up to five stories, towered on all sides in front of cracked stone streets. Steel poles rose from the ground, and their tips suggested they once held lamps to light the street even at night. They were long broken, though, and the buildings had mostly turned into shells of their former self by war, weather, and lack of repairs. So what could have been an impressive town across the wasteland turned into the refuse dump of Dais. In front of us, however, was the final gate, the last door to Dais. Not an hour after leaving Lucky, I had happened upon it and stood under it, breathless. It had been a week or more since I woke up and brought a hope, with a new leg and a new name. So many adventures and battles had led me to this place, but as I stood before it, I had no idea why. It was a mammoth of metal, wood, and surprisingly enough, thick black paint, and as I looked at it, I realized how little clue I actually had. My plan was to somehow get through this gate, find the watchers, and do something, and then make a profit. The robots guarding the gate didn't help my sudden feelings of insecurity. They were vaguely pony-like in the way of flowers, tree-like. They were stout torso-like boxes with rounded edges, lacking any pretense of legs, and instead were balanced by two wheels, one in the front, another in the back. Rather than a head, a stand with a monitor served, showing the static facing of an annoyed-looking pony with a rather fancy helmet. Off the back of the machine, where the tail should have been, was a beeping red antenna. Most distressingly were the panels etched into the surface of the pony, that when threatened, opened an array of huge automatic machine guns. When a small colt tried to make a beeline to the gate, I saw my own eyes a power of said guns. Behind me, Serenity wailed. I took one last look at the bloody colt, his blue body still twitching, and at the five ponytrons, guarding the gate before I turned and hefted Serenity onto my back. Growling a bit under my breath, I took a left turn down an empty alleyway and skid to an abrupt stop. Helping Serenity to the hard concrete, I gave her room as she curled into a ball, sobbing. 
I knew she'd seen death before, but that of someone so young seemed to have hit her harder than I expected. Knowing this, I should have tried to comfort her, but when I opened my mouth, my tongue tied itself into knots. Words refused to come, just as they refused before. Without words, what else could I do but take a step back and watch? She sobbed deeply. The tufts of her matted yellow and red mane bobbed with her. She was such a small little thing to hold so much sadness. Even if she tried to hide it, her mask was cracked and easy to see through. Stepping forward, I searched for something to say. Give me all your caps and no pony will get hurt. Turning my glare, I stiffened at the sight of a skinny-looking gray earth pony with a knife in his muzzle. Was he really going to threaten me? I had to wonder how much he was going to curse his timing as I reared out, my metal hoof connecting with a crack. Toppling to the ground, he rolled a few feet before halting. A great gash tore through his cheek and blood was beginning to pool around his head until he lifted it, that was. His gray face was painted red, his weapon nowhere to be found. Strolling casually up to him, I began my usual retreat and live spiel when his white eyes found me, burning with hatred. Before I could think, pain flared up in my chest where he bucked me. Backing up, I wheezed as my sight grew blurry. Not good. Guessing the second kick was coming, I lifted my metal leg in defense. My metal leg thudded and shook violently as my sight straightened itself. Ducking a third kick, I drove my head between his forelegs. Lifting my head, I tossed him off his feet. Hearing his body slam against the concrete, I decided he didn't deserve any mercy. Lifting my metal hoof, I was ready to end it. What is this? My head snapped to the alley entrance. Please believe me that what I saw is true, no matter how ridiculous it sounds. Before me stood five matching ponies of varying races. Their manes were a uniform white, save for two whose roots were starting to show. While over their eyes they wore bright pink goggles. Instead of protective burden or anything sensible like that, they only had on gaudy black and white and pink striped dresses complete with matching pink ascot. They strutted toward me with such arrogance I almost forgot I was in the middle of a fight. Oh, and for some reason, one of the ponies was blaring background music. I said, what is this? I blinked as the leader sauntered over to me, leaving her posse behind. Her dull blue coat seemed slick with sweat, but it looked to me to bother her done. Tried to rob me, I said plainly, my hoof raised, not leaving its place above the great pony's head. Below it, I could see him squirming and trying to protect himself from a blow which never came. Is that so? How is it possible to walk with your rump in the air like that? These strange, dress-wearing ponies must have been some sort of magical cult, or insane, or both. I was torn between possibilities as she leaned down and sniffed. Hmm, <laughs> this is not the sort of pony we want in our city. Girls, dispose of him. I cannot place the accent. It's like nothing I'd ever heard, or wanted to hear. The leader raised her hoof to her chest. I go, wait, I said. The pony stopped and glared at me through her thick goggles. Around me, her gang grabbed the raggedy body of the mugger and dragged him away. Clearly, they cared little for the well-being of their leader if they left her alone with me. What the fuck? I inquired as politely as I could. Do not tell me you've never heard of the great photo finish. Photo finish is what all ponies aspire to be. Oh, goddess, I hope not. Shaking my head, I waited for her to continue. Sigh. Did she just say the word sigh? never had a chance to ask as she quickly continued, her outrageous accent forgotten. Photo Finish was the most glamorous pony before the war. She set up a fashion company in Dyes and often instructed students in the way of fashion. She looked just a bit frustrated with me. And when my mother found her old studio, she devoted her life to bringing back her old style to the world. Ponies lost their sense of civility, she said. And by bringing back fashion, we can bring back all the socialization that's inherent in it. She finished her obviously rehearsed speech before the accent returned. Does that satisfy you? Yes, I said as blankly as I could, my mind still trying to understand what I was just told. Staring for a second, she brought a hoof to her chest. I go! And galloped off the way she came. Turning around, I saw Serenity staring at me, her gray eyes huge in shock. What? What? She stuttered slightly. What just happened? Nope. You had got to be kidding me. Why? I said, making my voice as flat as possible as my eyes scanned the store. It was disgusting to look at. Piles of guns, barely cared for, were strewn haphazardly around the room. Crates of mixed caliber ammo were shoved into the corner like a naughty child. My life in mayor for it was bucking the inside of my head, and it took all my strength not to push Deadhead away and fix the shop up myself. Weapons and ammo need to be taken care of. 
The crotchy old stallion just seemed a second closer to bellowing with each word. Ever since Major Lucky and his crew waltzed in, they've been pressuring me to stop my perfectly legal business practices. And the finishers are itching to get on the NCAA good side. I ain't sticking my neck out for some pony that I hardly know, so she and her whelp, her whelp who's touching my guns, Serenity! My voice cracked like a whip. Instinctively, she jumped back away from the shotgun she was towing. Says, so sorry, I just never seen a gun like this is all. Looking at the shotgun again, I just realized why. It was a small, pitch-black, semi-automatic shotgun with a pink stencil design. Not for kids my flank. Eh, it's not like he's gonna keep these loaded. They're safe. Occasionally, she gave this wise behind her years vibe, but underneath it, she was still just a kid, and still naive. Treat every gun as if it's loaded, I said. Back when I was a filly, handling weapon maintenance and ammo sorting, I was told to treat every gun we handled that way, and to treat each bullet as if it were a live grenade. Of course, I scoffed at first thinking I was too smart, if you can believe it, for that. But after Sidewinder was shot through the neck with a shotgun on accident, well, then I took those words to heart. Praying Serenity would be wise than I, I turned back to Deadhead. So, nope, sorry, can't do it. Unless you can convince those finishers to get the NCA off my back. I have to cut off my legitimate business practices. Shame I know. Now buy a gun or get the fuck out. As if I was going to buy a gun from someone who kept his stock in such ill repair. I might as well sign my own death warrant. A jammed gun at the wrong time was just asking for trouble. Yeah, I may not be the smartest pony to ever walk to wasteland, but at least I knew how to take care of things that kept me alive. Kicking the door open a bit too forcefully, I walked into the street to find a slight drizzle wet in my mane. Great. Serenity, my leg cuff, I spoke, turned around to find Serenity nowhere to be found. That wasn't until I looked back and Deadhead's gun emporium. She was sitting on her haunches, looking at that shotgun on the shelf above her head. Really? So much for wisdom. I literally pulled her out by the tail. She squealed and winning, but I was not in the mood to deal with such childishness. And to think she wanted to be my sidekick. Why now? We're not talking about this, I said, tossing Serenity roughly onto my back after attaching my plastic leg cover. I knew she was pouting, but I really didn't care. What if we get attacked again? By one of those muggers in the mound here? Could be dangerous. Could be deadly. An extra buff would miss or hit me on accident. I would not. On purpose, I continued walking through the damp haze. Serenity protested on my back, but soon quieted down when she realized it was not up for debate. The rain was warm and made me feel a bit sticky as I trudged through it, but thankfully, it was not very hard. We needed a place to sleep, and I'd seen an inn near the gate. At least that is what it looked like, and it looked to be open, too. The streets were empty as I made my way there save for a bedraggled blue pegasus on the sidewalk with his green and yellow mane plastered over his eyes. Finding it through the thin rain was easy enough. It was one of the few buildings with working lights, lights that read Death Clock Casino. Pushing the door open with my hoof, my senses were barraged. Lights flashed indiscriminately around the lobby in all the colors of the rainbow, and the ghoul comedian on stage could barely be heard over the extremely loud music pounding through the speakers. The color scheme was as gaudy as it was bright, no doubt to cover over the cracked, shoddy-looking walls. Welcome! Blinking, I realized I was being addressed. I turned to the small front desk, almost hidden in the wall and the two unicorns main in it. To the Vinnie Mae and Freddie Mac Death Clock Hotel and Casino. I don't know, but the names didn't seem nearly long enough. I'm Vinnie Mae, the female unicorn bowed, and I'm Freddie Mac. The male was obviously trying to mimic his partner's enthusiasm and failing. How can we help you? We have every possible vice for sale. What shall it be? Greed? Lust? What the hell was he talking about? After looking at him for a second, I glanced around the room, spotting a separate room where numerous game tables stood just out of reach. Haunting around them, other than the gamblers that is, were multiple pretty young mares in clothes that seemed scanty, even when taken into fact most ponies didn't wear clothes. Somehow the way their short dresses emphasized their flanks made them just that little bit more tantalizing. Just a bed, my voice sounded sour. Sloth it is, he chirped. A popular choice. Now would you like some love? Just a room, I snapped. Clearly this Franny Mac was an idiot or a creep if he thought I was going to hire pleasure with a child in my room. Chuckling, he slid the key over to me, and I slid caps over to him. I'd even trade. Now if only I could think of a reason to smash his muzzle in. Thank you, and remember, we here at Death Clock believe life is too short for virtues. Right, whatever. Pushing away, I cantered up the stairwell and ascended to the second floor. I couldn't help but notice that outside the two main rooms, the hotel let go its pretensions of excitement and painted every wall white, complete with large cracks and dust. 
The room was that much worse, looking like it hadn't been cleaned in years. A thick layer of dust covered the entire room, and I had to grab a single blanket in my mouth and shake it out just to get it somewhat clean. That was not to mention the large, suspicious brown stain on the wall where the tooth serenity found when opening the cabinet. Despite this, though, the room was large, dry, and most importantly, cheap. Flopping down the bed, I closed my eyes. Gun? I felt serenity snuggle up to my chest. Luckily, I realized she was saying my name, not asking for one before I chided her. Yes? Do you like me? You're being silly, I murmured. It had been a long day. I could already feel my consciousness fading. Of course I do. This is so boring, wildfire bitch beside me. Apparently, walking slow through identical-looking hills was not her idea of exciting. I'm saying we need to find a way to liven this up. What do you say, hon? She fluttered her long lashes at me, and I already could feel my face starting to burn up. I shook my head, though. Pay attention, I said. The road winded perilously, and I did not want a chance of a random attack. We were two of twenty from Marefort, assigned by our so-called protectors, the Crimson Hoof, to protect a valuable cart of goods north past their territory to trade off with a group that was to be meeting us there. We had not the pleasure of knowing the nature of the cargo, or why it needed so many protectors, and no one really felt like asking. In Marefort, if the Crimson Hoof said jump, our job was only to ask over what. Do what, hon? She giggled daintily. For some reason, the other mares in the caravan were more than happy to give us the rear guard alone and few wandered back to talk with us. Wildfire claimed it was because I was the frightening sort. Well, it was hard to argue with the true sort of logic. Even back at Marifort, most gave me a wide berth, and I was okay with that. Now only Wildfire would do the same. Everything, I said flatly. Hmm. She arched her back a bit and narrowed her green eyes. This is bandit country. Rolled my eyes, I did my best to ignore her and continue after the rest. Until she tackled me, that is. Raider, she squealed. Standing strong, I withstood her playful attack and raided myself with wildfire hanging off my back like a sack of apples. I'm not a raider. Struggling to maintain my composure, my mouth threatened to crack a smile. Now, <laughs> squealing, I tried to shake her off as she tickled me. Deep breaths. Just need to take deep breaths and resist. With a chuckle, I shook my whole body. Die, raider. Why'd she have to be in one of her moods? Her hooves proved too strong. My knees buckled and I giggled. I snorted, chuckled, laughed, cracked up, and even guffawed as I broke down in the dirt, tears streaming down my eyes from laughter. Sister, I couldn't speak without breaking out louder. Before long, she gave up her attack and stood over me, her red mane blowing in the wind triumphantly. Looking up, I managed to calm myself until an errant wind sent her mane into her eyes. Giggling like a lunatic, I buried my muzzle in my hooves. Oh, Celestia, it hurt. Beside me, I could hear wildfire start to chuckle and eventually laugh twice as hard as I ever did. This was ridiculous, I thought in between fits of laughter. They were supposed to be guards. Oh, yeah. Snorting, I raised my head and confirmed my fear. The caravan had moved along without us. Stifling back giggles, I nudged wildfire up my nose. She looked at me, her face red and winded from laughing. I nearly started laughing again, but I managed to stop myself. One of us had to be the adult hare, and she certainly was not rising to the occasion. They're gone, I said, pointing my head in the general direction we had been traveling. She jumped a bit and finally stopped laughing, for a few seconds anyway. Well, just follow the tracks, she pointed at the dirt. Easy, P. Without so much as a warning, the rain came. In an instant, we were both soaking wet and standing in an ever-increasing mud puddle. The tracks we were going to follow were washed away faster than I could spit, and I wanted to cry but at the sight of Wildfire's proud mop of curly red hair plastered across her face like a wet dog, I started laughing all over again. We overcame the second bottle of laughter as we managed to get our collective minds together. We followed along the path we had been going. Since our group had been following the road, we too followed it, and none too pleased as the hard rain pounded down with ever-increasing force. The water froze us to our very bones, and the mud was far from being helpful. It was sickening to the point wildfire cozied up to me as we walked, sniffling and sneezing, and we reached the fork. Suddenly, and for no reason I could see other than to piss me off, the road split into three separate paths. Try as I might, I could not suss out which road it was that our companions had traveled. Wildfire shook violently. I didn't get the benefit of time to figure it out either. Growling, I hefted her onto my back like a sack of apples. Funny how often that happens. She was heavy 
but nothing I couldn't handle as I galloped towards the nearest hillside praying for a cave. For once, Celestia saw fit to answer me. The entrance of the cave stood right in front of us, seemingly glowing through the thick rain. Perhaps it was destiny that brought us this particular cave. Easing wildfire down as we entered, I gave her a minute to rest. She coughed and wheezed, but quickly got back to her feet grimacing. Fucking chest, she mumbled to herself. Let's go in further, I said. The very last thing we needed was a raider gang to find this cave with us asleep. Although as we traversed the dank cave, it became clear that a raider gang had already found it. The darkness that should have been there was replaced by an orange glow as we walked further. The cave expanded to a great cavern, showing the remains of some hidden village, and it was on fire. Not a lot of fire, though, just the smoldering remains of certain stubborn buildings that turned the entire cavern into orange light and dancing black shadows. I marched wildfire over to the smallest and seemingly safest of these fires and bade her rest. She had gotten us into this mess, but now that we were knee-deep in it, and I'm not talking about the mud here, though it had stained both our coats to our knees, I had to take charge. I'll see if there's food, I said. Taking one look at me with her weary green eyes, she nodded and I trotted away. Food proved difficult, however, as I searched through the wreckage of the village. Pushing over rubble, I saw a blood-stained hoof sticking out. Gulping, I backed up. It was strange that we hadn't seen any bodies, but this one was blackened by fire and crushed. Whatever happened here, I was certain I did not want to know. Silver, Wildfire called to me. Ignoring her, I continued my search for food, making sure to stay far away from the crushed corpse. Silver! She repeated. After what her games caused, I was not in the mood for her whining. Waving my hoof dismissively, I prodded through a small stack of burnt sheet metal. Silver! What? I started. I saw what. Cut up between her forelegs was a charcoal gray filly. I woke up in an understandably pissy mood. There were bad dreams, and then there were dreams about her, that charcoal filly I'd been doing my best to forget. And even though I knew her name, I refused to think about. Desperately searching for something, anything else to think about, my eyes caught serenity. It could not have been more different, but just seeing another filly brought back the feelings again. Her eyes fluttered open. Hired? She said, her eyes only half open. I nodded slowly. Are, are you okay? I nodded again. You look like you were about to cry. I stopped for a second to wipe the tears from my eyes before reaching a hoof out to embrace Serenity. I'm fine. I know I didn't sound fine, and I sure as fuck didn't feel fine, but I want her to think I was. What time is it? I asked. She shrugged as I turned towards the shattered remains of our room window to see dull light peeking in. Filtered through the ever-present layers of clouds, I could only guess that it was morning. With a deep-chested sigh, I struggled all fours, my metal leg dull and motionless beneath me. Damn shame, too, as I was now down to my last power crystal and was hoping this one would last a bit longer. No point with what-ifs, though, so I motioned for Serenity to grab me a new one and carefully insert it into my leg. I could barely hear Serenity speak up over the sound of my leg whirling to start. Does it hurt? What? I asked. Your leg. Oh. I smiled down at her and shook my head. Only around magic. She blinked. Magic? Well, that don't make sense. It is magic, partly. All cybernetics are, don't you know? Else gems wouldn't work for power. How can I hurt around magic? Her face scrunched up a little as she poked at my leg. In truth, it was more like it burned because of whatever star metal I'm poisoning is. But I don't really want to get into that whole shebang. Don't worry, I said, beckoning her to follow me out of the room. And it wasn't nearly soon enough. After staying there, even the air tasted dusty. Marching downstairs, I took the time to think of some sort of plan. Clearly, I need to talk to the finishers and find a way to convince them to stop the NCA from arresting Deadhead so I could partake in his perfectly legitimate business services or find a way to get enough money to get into dice myself. The question was answered for me by a red mare in black, white, and pink striped dress waiting for me at the bottom of the steps. May his hire gun, with no accent. Oh, you should have used the funny voice, Serenity said beside me, mirroring my thoughts. Good girl. All the better to make me seem less stupid. What? I... Yeah, it matters not. Compared to the blue pony I spoke to yesterday, she was markedly less fun. You are a higher gun, her companion, are you not? 
At least she didn't say Serenity was my daughter. That was starting to get annoying. She kept talking well before I could even confirm my identity. I have been instructed to bring you to the fabulous photo finish. Now come. It is neither polite nor wise to keep such a wonderful mare waiting. She put no effort into her speech at all, sounding trite and listless. I followed along equally as listlessly. I had been hoping to make the choice on my own instead of it being forced upon me. Of course, I could have always said no to photo finish, but I had a feeling in my gut that it was going to be a really good offer. So as we walked through the rainy streets of Parasite Mound, I did my best not to let my disappointment show, which was easy enough when Serenity decided to make a show of jumping in puddles. I smiled for a minute before pushing her out and on our way. I didn't want a chance her catching a cold. I started up my radio to distract her from the ever-growing number of puddles. It's Mr. New Haggis here again with that thing we call the news. Shocking, I know. Well, it seems a store owner in Bridal Hope has been found dead of natural causes. A 308 caliber embolism. As natural as it gets in the wasteland. Residents aren't sure how the assassin managed to kill her unnoticed or why any pony would want such a kind of ma- Turn it off! Serenity pleaded. She didn't have to ask twice. It was not really the sort of distraction I'd been expecting or wanted. How could I have forgotten where I had found Serenity locked up in the first place? Luckily enough, we happened to have gotten to our destination anyway. It was a stout corner building that had the distinction of looking relatively well maintained in comparison to everything else and to have working lights in all the windows. On the front, painted pink and gold, were the words Photo Finish Gallery of the Magics. I had no idea what that was supposed to mean as we walked into the building. It was surprisingly subdued. There was a simple pink pattern wallpaper, but nothing nearly so gaudy as the Death Clock Casino, save for the multitude of mares wandering about in their matching outfits. Except they weren't all mares. I never would have noticed had I not been staring a bit too closely at one of their rears. I quickly looked away, flushed, and drove it from my memory, thinking they were all mares would just be easier on my mind. Quico! The red mare we had been following said, suddenly gaining an outrageous accent, and trotting at a much quicker pace that we were forced to follow. The winding halls had many doors flashing past my vision as we ran. Some seemed like bedrooms or dressing rooms, but many more were plain rooms adorned with white backdrops and a series of large lights and cameras. The second floor, I learned as we zoomed up the stairs and through it, consisted almost entirely of sleeping chambers. By the third floor running, I was just about ready to hit the stupid red pony. Why the hell was the boss's room on the top floor? By Celestia, that was aggravating. What I wouldn't give for an elevator. We finally made it, red faced and out of breath. The red finisher bade us take some time to compose ourselves, I mean to make it look like we hadn't just run up three flights of stairs, before opening the door and letting us see what all the fuss was about. The room was simple and nearly without ornamentation, except the multitude of cushions on the floor and a small pink bed with a huge closet beside it. Inside the room, gasp, was the same blue pony that we had met yesterday. You bring them? She asked, and the red finisher nodded. One the bar. Screenshot. Go. She pointed dramatically as Screenshot galloped back out. Screenshot is loyal, yeah? She said, directing her glass-covered eyes to me in serenity. Not as, you would say, enthusiastic. She smiled a bit, pointing to a series of cushions in front of her. Sit. Now. Something about her voice demanded to be listened to. I... Photo finish, I'm going to make you a star, she said, raising a hoof to the sky dramatically as we sat down. Serenity started to giggle until I shot her a look. I'm not a model, I said. Had to get that out in the open as soon as possible. Wildfire bought me a dress once. I'll spare you the gore details. Suffice to say, it did not end well for any pony. Darling, of course not. No, I, photo finish, have greater plans for you. She rose to her back legs with her forelegs waving triumphantly in the air before standing back up proper. She sure was laying it on thick. You have heard of the Enclave Remnant, yeah? Vaguely, I said and shrugged, waiting for her to stop moving so erratically. Met one, claimed his group broke off from the ones above. So, to be clear, she did not once stop moving around like a goldfish on dash. They are strong, fearsome, rich. The finishers must have them as allies. However, a delinquent known as Flair, a former enclave himself, has taken to Parasite Mound and is causing no end of trouble. His drug addled ways are an embarrassment to the remnants, and embarrassments they do not often forget. He must be reformed or taken care of. Obviously we, the finishers, seek to educate the world of beauty and glamour. 
killing is not our way. So, I said, still waiting for a job offer. So, say he has found the way of drugs, or went missing. Remember, it's my crack of smile. So, I said, she faced hoof dramatically. Adding the adverb dramatically after everything she did was getting redundant, so feel free to add it yourself from now on. So if you had gun deal with said pony, you may find Deadhead's business up at your very eloquent command. Moreover, you may find the greatest gang in all of days in your debt. You become famous, a rising star in the city of rocks. I was not sure whether to comment on the creepiness that she knew about me trying to get a passport. The irony of her rising star comment giving my cutie mark or the fact that she spoke so passionately she knocked a lamp off her desk with a crash. Sure, I said, shrugging my shoulders. Now, she pointed at the door. You go. He wasn't hard to find. And then they came flying out of the sky like whoosh, wham. But I wasn't scared, so I took out my guns all like Jimmy Chanka, rat ta ta boom, smash. Got shot pretty bad, but you know, I wasn't scared and I picked myself up and... At this point, I feel it's important to mention all I did was ask him his name. Serenity giggled along with him as he chanted his story in a tone I was positive, part enthusiasm and part dash. No wonder the remnants thought he was an embarrassment. He was. And that's why they call me Flair. And then what happened? Serenity, please. For my sanity, I silently pleaded for him to shut the fuck up. Well, you see, I, I am addicted. I finished for him, shocking him enough to find a lang, giving me a good look at him. His blonde and green mane stuck to his head and down his neck. Whisking his similarly colored tail behind him, I could see him tense up his light blue body underneath his red jumpsuit. He was so skinny I could see his ribs through his clothes. Fuck no. Yeah, I take a puff now and then to calm my nerves, but did you just say calm? Oh, for fuck's sake. I charged. My head slammed into his chest, cracking ribs and sending him sprawling to the ground, wings spread out and losing feathers. Stepping up, I pressed my unmetal hoof on his neck. Hi, don't hurt him, Serenity squealed behind me. Against my better judgment, I released some of the tension on his neck, giving him just enough room to cough uncomfortably. Listen, carefully, I said, lowering my head so close that my warm breath blew on his neck, standing his coat up on ends. You are an addict. That means the remnants don't like you, so the finishers don't like you. I need them to like you, so they can help me. Was that subtle enough? I never was sure. By the way, he was shivering under my hoof on the cold gray street. I figured he got the message. Man, fuck you. I can take whatever I want. It's free. No, it's not. Mr. Flair? Serenity poked her head around my leg and moved close to him. You should listen to my, uh, if she said mommy, I swear. Friend. She's all like a mercenary, you know. You're a nice mister, and I like your stories. The photo told her to get you off the street one way or the other. Bloody brain clouds. You want me clean so the remnants can save face? Well, fuck them. I want you clean. Drug addicts piss me off so I don't have to kill you. My hoof pressed down hard on his neck and I could feel his neck bone pressing against my hoof. His face started to purple and he gasped. But I didn't let go until he nodded at his stupid drug addled head. Ah, fine, bitch, don't. He gasped for breath on his back as I stepped back and his wings flapped uselessly. I... I wanted to kick, to kick Dash, nothing but trouble. It's good, I mean, but he blinked for a second, staring up at me. It almost looked like he was going to cry. Just what I needed, more crying ponies. What do you need, I asked. What? To get clean. I don't imagine it'd be anything simple like talking to a scared mare with a metal leg or giving me ten doses of fixer and I'll totally quit forever. Though I'm sure those two things helped. Actually, Serenity? Search him. The familiar burning sensation of Serenity's magic flared up in my shoulder as her horn glowed lightly. A faint pink glow surrounded the Pegasus as various unmentionables flew out of his pockets. In total, we collected seven doses of Dash, two syringes of Medex, a pill bottle of Buck, something called Hydra, three tin containers of Mentiles, and one of its cousin part of time Mentiles, all of which I stuffed deep in my pack for later. Not to use, to sell, obviously. Well, it was tempting, as Serenity was removing them from Flair, thought it necessary to go into a long-winded speech about the effects of each of them. Honestly, the idea of chewing a mint and suddenly becoming smarter sounded far-fetched to me. According to him, he only took Dash and just kept the rest to trade with other addicts if need be. No, I didn't believe him. Now, we need you clean, or clean enough, I said. 
All the drugs weighing down my pack made me feel more dirty than the mere thought I'd stolen them from an addict. A sign of the times, I guess. Clean enough for what? Yeah, it's just a job for you, ain't it? Clean enough and then leave me back to the wolves. Might as well kill me, you. Shut up, I snapped. Apparently, nearly strangling an opponent near death was enough to convince him to listen when you speak. Enough to get in Dais. You'll come with me. See the Watchers. As if the Watchers would... They would so. Serenity literally bounced. The Watchers help every, and I mean every pony that needs as long as you can get to them. They could fix you up some good, I tell you. Got special methods for flushing the body out of toxins and what have you. Come on, what do you say? Let us help you, help us, help you, help us both. Wait, what? Wait, what? Flaring tone before I got the chance. Well, whatever. Yeah, okay, I need fixer. I ain't... Okay, it's gonna seem odd, but I'm broke. Taking one look over his skinny body and dirty clothes, I raised an eyebrow. That's not the weird part. It's that, well, there's this gang hiding under the finisher's noses. They like, they like to sell this shit real cheap-like. Without them, I wouldn't be able to buy nothing. It'd help if they were, you know... No, I did not. Dispaired. I raised an eyebrow. Fucking kill him, I mean. Oh, huh. Now that was a dilemma. I shook the rain out of my hair as I thought. Normally, I would have to charge a lot for a job like that as involved murder-like activities. On the other hoof, this whole thing was more like a huge job with the ending being entrance into Dais. Then again, I just procured hundreds of cats worth of drugs, or as Deadhead would call them, perfectly legal reality modifiers. I guess a few drug dealers were worth it. How armed could drug dealers be? Okay, I said. Ha! You ain't so bad, missa. On the condition you come with. The shock in his face was clear and very amusing. The thing is, I couldn't justify leaving Serenity by herself at the hotel in a place like Parasot Mound, and I certainly was not going to let a drug addict look after her while I was away. The only logical choice was to bring them both and have Flair and Serenity stay far back enough to avoid fire, but close enough I would be able to keep track of them. Then again, I am an idiot. Now, maybe I should have waited for him to agree, but that would involve giving a damn what he thought. Where's this base? Below, he said shakily. Below us? Well, that didn't sound good at all. Hey, you never heard of the Paradise Sewers? Sewers was a patently incorrect term. Apparently, the massive underground tunnels buried beneath the last city were created as a fallout shelter by a wealthy stallion who owned most of the city before the war. Mr. Walkirk, as Flair called him. Not trusting stable tech to protect non-equestrians, he built them under the disguise of a massive storm drain for the yearly storms that often flooded parts of the city. From the looks of it, they didn't either job well, unless you count it being a pain in the ass to get into a job well done. Sure, there were many pony hole covers and drains that led into it, but there was no way for any pony, unless you're a pegasus, to go straight down without, you know, falling. So he had to find and locate a small rubble-strewn building with one of the few entrances available in the parasite mound. After finding it, it was up to me to push the heavy lid off the hole in the ground, revealing a spiral staircase that was disturbingly narrow. After a harrowing climb, for me anyway, as Flair just flew and Serenity rode my back, we finally made it into the sewers. We came out of the small stair room into a long hall with vaulted ceilings and gray walls covered in cracked and yellowing with decay. Even still, the lights on each wall were still lit. The floor was a metal grate that made my leg clang noisily with each step. Below the rusting grate was a swirling river of green water that seemed to flow into small crevices in the wall. Know anything else about this place? I asked. The sound of water leaking through the cracks in the ceiling or from the grates connecting to the surface was going to drive me bonkers. Even Flair was preferable. I know everything. Back before I quit the remnants, we used to use the tunnels for secret transport. Goes all across the east, they do. Well, why the hell didn't we just take these instead of going through the front door? I thought to myself. But all the interest today is proper have been claimed by some gang and are monitored in the like. Still bribes off enough to convince them, but they might take it and kill you anyway. Sounded like a lovely time. Still, lots of ponies live down here. He motioned his head to a door on my right. That leads to a small village. Nice folk. Mostly shy, though. Stay on the ground except for trading and scavenge. Though plenty of salvage to be had here. Lots of places here want radiation proofs. So ponies die clutching their remaining treasure. Well, if you don't got a problem scavenging from corpses. Why if history had shown anything? Wait. He stopped, turned to a small door with a brown stain on it in the shape of an X. And here. Okay, just go in, take him out. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? 
Right. I said. I bucked open the door with a resounding crash. The poor guard didn't know what hit him as my bullet shot through his brain pan, splattering the wall with gore. Squealing behind me, Serenity hid behind Flair. As much as I hated bringing her to a place like this, I could see no other real way of protecting her. Yes, I'm an idiot. Why do you ask? The hallway on the other side of the door was different than the main hall. It had no grate on the floor or river underneath. And while its walls were still high, they weren't as much so. The lights on the wall were similarly still working, but very dim. Oh yeah, and hanging from the roof was a flayed pony in a spread eagle position like a grotesque flag. Flare? I warned. Make sure Serenity does not look up. Me? I couldn't help myself. The thing was staring down at me with empty holes where its eyes should have been with its lips peeled away showing a row of broken teeth. Its entire coat and skin was stripped away to the muscles underneath. Some half clinging to the body and half falling down loosely revealing bones underneath. Tearing my eyes off the monstrous monument to pony indignity, I made my way back down the hall. The doors on either side of the hallway seemed for the most part boarded up and blocked with debris so I ignored them. The only door that seemed to matter was a small door on the other end of the hall, which opened. Well, that wasn't good. Two ponies appeared from inside the room, which seemed to me to be an excessively small broom closet. I never did get a good look at them as I realized one was magically holding a rocket launcher. No time. I spun around, grabbing Serenity and Flare, and dove behind a pile of debris just as a rocket flare passed. The sound was deafening, and the light blinding. It exploded against the fire wall, covering us in dust as we huddled in relative safety. Minutes passed until the roaring in my ears settled down, but my head still stung and voices were fuzzy. You okay, Hard? Serenity said, looking up at me surprisingly unhurt with her horn glowing lightly. Nodding, I turned my attention to the door. Peeking out from the rubble, I scanned for our attackers. Only they weren't there. The only sound I could hear, and admittedly my hearing was still weak, was a faint trickle of water from the main hallway far behind us. Wait here, I said. Flair nodded dumbly, biting his lips so hard it looked almost bleeding. Sneaking out from behind the rubble pile, I turned back to where we came. Past the door I kicked in, the gray wall was black and even more cracked with the entrance itself measurably larger than it had been. Making my way slowly, I crept as low as my massive body could go until I reached the supply closet to find two charred ponies. From their back legs to their necks, they were a blackened mess of burnt flesh and hair smelling vaguely food-like. My stomach rebelled at the thought and I quickly turned away from them, motioning for my gang to move forward, not before pushing the corpses back into the similarly burnt room and closing the door. What happened? Flair asked with strange brevity. Back blast, I said. Another weapon lesson from long ago. Rocket launchers expel gas out the back to avoid massive kickback. But a fire with ponies behind you or in a sealed room, the effects, well, they were as seen. Potentially deadly and always stupid. Not the brightest ponies, as I said. Serenity giggled a bit while Flair just shrugged, looking around warily. Shouldn't we be? He started. Going? I finished. Yeah, yeah. Can I bask in the glory of one thing I actually know? The next stage in our roaring rampage of revenge was easy enough to figure out. The drug dealers were not the brightest, and as already pointed out, their sections of the sewer had every door blocked save for the ones that led into the boss's chambers. So I simply went through the only possible door on the right side of the hall, besides the storage closet. This room was more like a small room, with three bunk beds pressed against the walls. I scanned the room twice over, making sure no ponies were hiding in wait. If they didn't know we were here by now, they were truly not very bright. I took a single step. Fuck. Looking down, I gulped, already feeling sweat trickle down the back of my neck. Under my hoof was a small disc that was beeping ominously up at me. Slowly, I started to lift my hoof up. Wait! Flare zoomed past me, floating at eye level, his wings beating hard. Don't move. That's a mine. You'll blow yourself the fuck up. And unless you want to lose the other leg, just don't move. Nothing made a pony more fidgety than being told not to move. Just don't. I'll get it. Reaching into his pack, he came out with a bobby pin and a screwdriver in his mouth. I got it, he mumbled. Five tenths minutes later, the beeping stopped. Lifting my hoof off slowly, I was relieved I didn't explode. Grinning, the blue pegasus snatched the device in his mouth and sliding it back into his pack. What? I used to be an explosive expert back before I quit. Know how to make them explode, and you know how to make them not explode, you know? I had no idea. 
but I was still kicking. I attempted to pat him on the back to no avail. With a touch, he quickly twitched backwards, leaving me hanging. He said, Sorry, last time. Last time, I almost choked him to death. Funny, in the wake of him saving my life, I'd forgotten that fact. Honestly, considering the facts, I surprised he went through the trouble saving my life to begin with. I tore him from his cover zone into a bloody war zone. He should want me dead. Tone has made no sense. Let's go, I said. The small bedroom was small enough and completely empty of life. I wanted to waste time. I charged forward. Wait, Flair screamed. Ain't you going to look around? Look around? I turned my head one way and the other. Boxes, boxes, bed, trash, lock safe, bed, and bed. Looking around done. I mean scavenge. They've got to have good loot. Please tell me he was kidding. From the way his pink eyes played with me, I knew he wasn't. We're kind of in a hurry, I said. But... Hired, Serenity whined. Just for one minute. How could I say no to those big puppy dog eyes? Phillies were tricksy. Five minutes. Much squeeing and position giving away was had. And again, I was pretty sure at that point everyone was well aware we were coming. And I kind of liked the idea of ponies counter behind desks, wondering if we'd ever come for them. Hired, I heard the pink filly wail as her magic struggled with a locked safe. Hell! With a heavy sigh, funny how often I sigh, isn't it? I slowly walked over to the small metal box. It won't open. You need to... Clang. The metal box reflected my leg, sending it shooting back so hard I nearly lost balance. Why would you do that? You can't kick everything open. You're going to ruin your leg. Sure I could. I just need more practice. Trying to step my metal hoof down, I suddenly wobbled, nearly topping over before I took my weight off it. The fucking hoof on my metal leg was bent all askew and surrendered with giggling triumphantly at my distress. That was until I slammed the damn thing down as hard as I could, forcing it back to its original state. Mostly. Time's up. Let's go. All kind of we had collected. A huge pile of trash. I loathed the thought that we'd have to try and sell this shit later. Not that I really had any option to throw it out the way Serenity was watching me. What the heck would I ever need wonder glue for? Maybe if we had actually managed to open the damn safe, it'd have been worth all the time and embarrassment it took. We done. Ha, huh, thanks. We need to scavenge more often. Back in the Watchers, they used to tell me the Wastelanders would be much better off if they stopped to look through empty rooms. They said your life could be in there. Well, because that made perfect sense. Let's go. Like the rest of this poorly designed drug dealer base, the room was completely linear. Two doors, the one we came from and the wooden door at the other side of the room. It couldn't be more simple. In fact, the whole adventure had been just a teensy bit too easy, apart from being nearly blown up twice. I changed my mind. This whole adventure had been a pain in the flank and it'd be a godsend once we were finally out of this filthy, stinking hole in the ground. I knocked twice on the wooden door, shouting through it. Listen up. Whoever's in there, leave now. Leave everything on the floor. You live. Fight back, you die. I backed up a step and waited, my eyes watching the door. I was just hoping the remaining drug dealers on the other side were sane enough to take my offer. They weren't. Then it exploded. Shrapnel tore through the air as the shockwave sent me spinning to the ground. My ears roared as my body smacked against the floor. I groaned as the flames washed over me briefly, leaving me sore but alive. Lifting my head, I saw the body of a purple mare drug dealer glowering at me through the smoke. There was no time to think. I rolled quickly on my back, a shot ringing against the floor where I'd been laying. Struggling to my feet, my hearing returned, broadcasting the groans of my companions behind me, followed shortly by a second shot. Pain struck through my ear, and already I could feel the blood flowing down my cheek. I didn't allow her a third shot. My first bullet tore through her leg and sent her to a bloody knee. The second slammed into her chest with a meaty thud. She looked straight at me as the life faded from her eyes. Gasping for one last breath, she slowly toppled over, a pool of blood forming around her corpse. I forced myself to look away, releasing the breath I realized I was holding. My ear throbbed and my face felt sticky with blood. Well, I started, turning to my companions. That went what? It had been going so well, too. Cleared out a drug nest, helped out a community, saved a Pegasus from addiction, got a pass into the City of Lights for our efforts. Of course, I couldn't have such luck. Serenity was laying in Flair's forelegs, breathing heavily, a large wooden splitter lodged in her chest. 
Footnote. New perk. Element of loyalty. When you drop below 50% hit points, companions gain damage threshold. Skill note. Explosives. 25. 